the Suicide Club, you know, ended. The Suicide Club, a very intense experiment, and uh, and ended after probably about five years. Um, Gary died shortly after that of a heart attack. He wasn't uh, particularly unhealthy. And he wasn't a drug user, an alcoholic. He had a blood disease, phlebitis, and he died at 35. Or else you would have heard of him, and everybody would have heard of him because he was planning to write and had already started writing a lot of his experiences. Uh, and at that point in time, he had he had incredible rich experiences. But anyway, he died, and uh, there's a kind of a fallow period. I, I went off and went climbing a lot of bridges by myself and started photographing bridges, which is a thing I did for some years. Other people did other things, and then about 1986, uh, a lot of people who'd been in the Suicide Club were, were kind of bored. And uh, uh, Gene Mashovsky and Lance Alexander and a few other people decided it'd be a good idea to start another group. And there was some ambivalence with some people, but other people were really ready to do another group, similar as the Suicide Club. Now, we were uh, grossly unprepared to be organizers, you know, even though we'd done organizing of events in the Suicide Club. I mean, like I say, Gary was a really singular person. He was a really unique, unique individual. But So we did the best that we could. Um, Gene was kind of the one who called the uh, shots and got the group going. And then, uh, you know, we started in the summer of 86. And we started doing events pretty much immediately. And the there were some, it was very similar to the Suicide Club in most respects, but there were some very important differences. And some of the important differences were filtered through a fellow named Lance Alexander. And Lance, like all of the rest of us who started Cacophony, uh, it, it, you know, was in the Suicide Club before. And uh, he was in the, you know, the original group of people who actually f founded, you know, Cacophony. I mean, I was, I got involved a few months later. But um, he had never really organized any events in the Suicide Club. He kind of got involved later on, but he was very interested in the, in the process of event organizing. How do people, he was very interested in the ideas about how do people organize their lives so that they can do creative work with other people that is not based on commerce, that's not about money, which is one thing that Gary was doing. This is stuff that's not based on commerce. We did not charge money for these events other than a tiny stipend to cover whatever expenses we might have had. For instance, if we were taking people in cars, we charge people 50 cents for gas, so we'd pay, pay for a tank of gas, um, that sort of thing. But there's no, no real, uh, there's no real, uh, no no commerce taking place. Hello. Hey. So, um, where are we at? Uh, we're um, starting the cacophony story. Yeah, the, the, big difference, so, the big difference. So. Right. So Lance is, so Lance is also a very smart guy, and he saw the process of the Suicide Club as being very successful for accomplishing certain things. One of the things that it accomplished, it was, it was an an, sort of an anarchistic overview with a very controlled minor chord. And let me explain that. Gary uh, and, his, and his friends, Dave and the rest, Adrian, organized the Suicide Club around a monthly newsletter. We called it the Noose Letter, you know, because of the Suicide Club, right? Newsletter, anyway. Um, so anyone could be, anyone could be and was, in, hope, was encouraged to be an editor. So no one ran, there was no... I'm the editor of the, of, the, of the newsletter. Nobody ran it. Gary didn't run it. He wasn't the boss. Nobody said what you could or couldn't do. And so the editorship of the newsletter rotated every month. There was a different editor every month. And we, we, we want, really wanted everyone to be editor at least once. So, of course, quality control, there was no quality control. Some of the newsletters were done very nicely. The lettering was very good. You know, the layout was really nice. Others were barely legible. Okay, but it didn't matter. What mattered was that it was free. That people, that everyone got an opportunity to be part of the process of organizing this. What little organization there was, there was very little organization. The only other position that was uh, necessary was treasurer, because we had to print these newsletters and mail them, which cost a little bit of money, not much, but a little bit of money. So every four months, the treasurership would rotate. Someone new would be treasurer, which of course, you know, I mean, means that it wasn't. We, we didn't have accountants doing this right. So <laughs> it was a little bit messy, but it worked for some for some time. So that was kind of the open anarchistic aspect of the organizing core of the Suicide Club. Now, on specific events, okay, in other words, like I'll give my, my events as an example. I did a lot of climbing events, a lot of sewer events, I did a lot of urban infrastructure events that were physically dangerous and potentially dangerous. And so I would list on my events I was a complete fascist on my events, and if you came on my event, you had to do exactly what I said, or else fuck you, you can go do your own event. But the interesting thing about the Suicide Club, and other people were like that, some other people were much more laissez faire or didn't care, but, the, but you could organize your own event as tightly controlled as you liked. 
So I could do an event like climbing the Golden Gate Bridge, and as we l learned more about climbing and doing dangerous things, uh, we would make this event as safe as possible for people, as safe as we could. So I would say, no drugs and no alcohol in my events. And that was a dead set. You could not bring drugs or alcohol in my events. Uh, if you did, you'd be asked to leave, and that happened once or twice. People were, we didn't want to get rid of their marijuana. We're like, you can't go on the event. You have to leave your marijuana here. And they're like, oh, wait, it's just marijuana. And they're like, sorry. If you want to hold on to your marijuana, you can't come. Can't come. And so I actually kicked a guy off my event one time because he wouldn't. He just thought it was outrageous that I was telling him he couldn't bring a joint, you know. But we were going to do something that was already dangerous, and it was. I call it the rule of two. When I didn't invent the rule of two, the rule of two is if you're doing something stupid and dangerous and illegal, don't do a second stupid and dangerous and illegal thing. Just do one. That's enough. So if you're trespassing, that's enough. So even though we didn't vandalize, we weren't taggers. We didn't do that kind of thing. Um, we were trespassing a lot of these a lot of these places. Golden Gate Bridge, clearly, even though there weren't signs where we went onto the bridge, uh, you know, you would you would imagine you weren't supposed to climb it, right? So uh, we knew we weren't supposed to do it. So I had these hard and fast rules for my events, and other people did as well. So that's the that was the brilliant that to me that was the the really smart and amazing simple organizing uh, organizing uh, m mechanic uh, uh, or mechanical aspect of the Suicide Club that allowed us to do some of the pretty amazing stuff that we did. Now, as I mentioned before, we were amateurs. We didn't know how, when we started out, we didn't know how to do anything. For instance, climbing. I was a very good climber, just a natural climber because I was a good climber. Um, but we didn't, none of us knew how to do technical climbing. None of us were technical rock climbers. None of us were cavers. We did that later. So the first, when we first started sneaking into buildings, me and two or three other people could climb the building. We'd climb a pipe on the building or something like a monkey. But most people, these are pretty average people. We, we weren't a bunch of athletes, right? So most people couldn't do that. So we had to get them up on the roof of the building or the warehouse or up on the side of the bridge using something, a ladder or something. So what we did, we referred to you know, Pulp Fiction and to uh, movies. We thought, well, we need a rope ladder, okay? We, we have to build a rope ladder, but there's no internet then, so you can't go on the internet and find some efficient, good way to build a lightweight climbing ladder or to buy one. You just couldn't do it. So what we did is we, referring to the movies, like, like Tarzan movies, Tarzan and the Green Goddess, where there's a rope ladder, it's a big rope ladder. So we made a ladder. We got hemp rope, tied it on Dave Warren's house, which is, he was in a three-story apartment building, dropped it down and, and made wooden slats this big like 30 of them, and we dropped them down the ladder, tied a knot, dropped drop down the ladder, tied a knot, dropped them. And we, hunt, we made a ladder that rolled up this big, and it weighed 90 pounds. <laughs> it was completely beyond ridiculous. Okay, but you started with Lance. This is important. Well, I'll get back to Lance. It's important because, and this may not seem important, but it's important because we learned how to do it. We just did it because we saw it in a movie. Okay, we used that stupid ladder to climb into buildings. I'd climb up on a building, pull it up with a rope, and we'd tie it off, and people climbed it. We used it for four, five, six months, going into all kinds of places, and it worked. But it was incredibly inefficient. Later, we learned how to get better at climbing. We learned climbing technique. We actually ended up joining the National Speleological Society. It was a caving group. They taught us how to do technical climbing. So I now have a, a cable ladder that rolls up that big. That big, it weighs less than two pounds, and it's 40 feet long. Okay, so that's what we use. But anyway, we, it took us a while to learn that. So Lance Alexander, starting the Cacophony Society, he synthesized these concepts that Gary Warren and the others had 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 pioneered in the Suicide Club. He said, "Well, let's keep the good stuff that works. Let's not let's throw out the bad stuff that doesn't work." Now the Suicide Club became more insular and more um, kind of paranoid as time went on. We did bigger and bigger events. We got better at organizing events, but we started to lose some of the freeform spirit of the earlier group, which was we could do anything and. We didn't really know each other that well, so it was a really fertile group of people. Once we got to know, and once everybody gets to know everybody really well, and people, everybody f slept with, fucked everybody else at some point, and then so we, this clique started to form. And, and and even though we became much more proficient at organizing impressive events, like I mean, I did an event where we snuck into the Golden Gate Bridge cable housing, this giant concrete room as big as a, an apartment building with cables coming into it. We snuck in a hundred people blindfold, blindfolded, they didn't know where they were. We had light show in it, we had fog machines, we had in, at, we had performance things going on. Okay, this is a very elaborate event, but it was later in the life of the Suicide Club and it lacked a lot of the spontaneous uh, you know, group cohesion of the earlier group because what happened was in the early, in the first year, anybody could do an event. Everyone was kind of equal. But then as time went on, people had a proclivity for event organizing, or who were more egotistical, or more 
whatever, more out there, would, would, would start getting more attention for stuff that they were doing. And that started breaking down the really interesting social cohesion that the earlier group had had. It became cliquish. It became, we got, we got to know one another too well. And uh, that, the, and that event eventually served as one of the main reasons for the demise of the group. The other thing was we became very paranoid. We began to believe that the police would want to find out what we were doing because we were sneaking, we were sneaking the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, we're doing all the stuff we're not supposed to do. So we got very paranoid about it. We became very locked down. And so we didn't get new people joining the group because Communiversity by then had stopped being a, uh, a kind of a breeding ground for, for the Suicide Club. We weren't really recruiting from Communiversity anymore. So we weren't getting any new people. And so it was just the same old people over and over again. And people slowly by attrition left. And so the, the club really ran out of steam after about five years. It was just too intense. The, the, the intensity of the social and the, and the physical interaction and the, and the interaction with the world outside was very intense. And so it died. And everybody, you know, I was very disappointed, extremely disappointed. And Gary died, and I was devastated. Se several people, many of us were, uh, were very devastated. He was a hugely inspirational person. Um, hard to describe. Not a standout egotist, not a, not a uh, obvious. He, he had a very solid charisma, but it was very understated. Not so, an ego. So Lance, with with who, with Kim University or with Cacophony, who you keep feeling for, Lance took the ideas of the Suicide Club. He realized that one of the things that killed the Suicide Club, and that's why I was telling you this, is that it was just, it became more insular and more paranoid, and it wasn't open to new people. So he thought it was worth the risk to be a more open group and to be more open to the general public, and that people would filter through the group. And he was right about that. That was a good. So we we didn't have we weren't paranoid. We didn't. Uh, we didn't uh, 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 keep people from writing articles about the Suicide Club because in the first year of the Suicide Club there were three or four articles written about it and then we just stopped. We stopped allowing journalists to write about the group. We didn't want them to write about it because we thought it would we thought it would damage our ability to do clandestine. And the Society was uh, much more proactively, open. proactively looking Proact for publicity? No, or just not, not so much, but we, we didn't dissuade it. But it came... It. Yeah, we put our flyers out the same as we did. And there are some events that we would do, actually that we were a little bit more proactive because there's larger events we would do a press release for them. So yeah, we were, some events, it, it, once again, it, there was no dog, there was no, not dogma, there's no uh, protocol. You, had, you could make stuff up kind of as you wanted. There was a general, there was, a, what there was was a subculture. Gary Warren helped create a subculture and a culture in San Francisco that went on, which is the, the culture that Burning Man came out of. It was a culture that a lot of urban exploration was, uh, was informed by. It was a culture that, uh, you know, that Fight Club grew out of. I mean, he helped start and engender and create a culture. And so Cacophony carried on with that. It was a newer iteration that was a more open iteration, but it was also much larger, became a much larger group. And uh, what would happen is we'd have a monthly meeting for Cacophony. The events were similar, although I say a little bit not quite as illegal. We weren't quite as risque. But we would have a monthly meeting where people would come to the meeting and let's say they read about the Cacophony Society in the San Francisco newspaper, in the Examiner, their articles. They read about it and go, wow, this sounds like a lot of fun. I think I'll go do this. And so they show up at our meeting, and out of every big article that came out, maybe 20 people showed up at the meeting that were new. And out of those 20 people, you know, they'd go on an event, and most of them would run away screaming. Because it was not, I'm serious, it was not a hipster thing. It wasn't a cool thing to do. People read about something in the paper, see it on TV, and they think, ooh, that's cool, I want to do that because it's cool. We wanted people to do it because they wanted to do crazy shit. You know, we weren't interested in people wanting to be cool. This was something that we shared in common with Survival Research Labs, another group that I really love. It was an amazing group. Not a hipster group, okay? People would show up at SRL, which was very famous in the art scene in the, uh, in the uh, 80s, and they'd want to be cool and hang out with cool people, you know, cool art stuff. Mark would, if somebody would show up at SRL, Mark Pauline would hand him a pair of gloves and like a shovel and tell him to go in a grease pit and clean the grease pit. I'm serious. I watched him do it. He'd give him the shittiest job there was. You know, the people, you know, the hipster kids coming in with their clean clothes and everything. And they'd leave. You know, and the ones that stayed were the ones that wanted to make machines and blow shit up. They were the ones who wanted to work on a cool project, a good project. They wanted to do it. They weren't just people who wanted to hang out and, and be hipsters, right? So there was, a, there, was a, there was a threshold that people had to, had to kind of, and it wasn't like, we didn't have rules, they didn't have to follow our rules, but there was a, a psychic threshold that people had to meet. Now, Survivor Research Lab, that's, that's an interesting uh, parenthesis here. Mm -hmm. Can you say a few words about them? Survival Research and, Lab. And, and what connection you had with Kakofi sure. Society, other than knowing each other? Be because, there was some crossover. Because there's a point where you start the Burning Man and most of the people who exhibit there, who build things there, come 
from SRL. A lot of them came from SRL. Right. The machine art people came from right. SRL, right. yes. Right. Well, the, there is a crossover. Okay, so Survival Research Labs was a group started by Mark Pauline, and then he later took his partners, Eric Werner and Matt Hecker. He started in 1978, and he was, a, he was an artist. He went to art school. Uh, he got an art degree, and he wanted to have a career and a life as an artist. And he was a very much a machinist and a, and a machine. He wanted to make machine art. And he started making these machines that would interact and attack one another and, and uh, do pretty amazing stuff. And he would incorporate, he would incorporate uh, uh, mummified animals into the machines. He'd put animal bodies on the machines. He was uh, inspired by and inspired J.G. Ballard, J uh, the, the British writer J.G. Ballard was a huge fan of SRL. Mark Pauling was initially heavily influenced by Ballard and his writings, these uh, sort of like uh, prescient post-apocalyptic you know, fantasies of how the world was going, very prescient. Uh, uh, and, so, and so there's an aesthetic that he specifically designed, and he was a single artist who, who encouraged and, 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 uh, and uh, collected a large group of, te of artists, technologists, technicians, uh, and, uh, and machinists, and, and, mach and, uh, and, uh, and, and people like that to become part of his group, Survival Research Labs. And he got a huge warehouse space, which was very cheap at that time. And he would go into the many, many hundreds of abandoned buildings in San Francisco, and the abandoned ships, which there were abandoned ships on the, on the waterfront. And he would liberate material from them, motors, forklifts. He would liberate stuff. And uh, I started, Gary Warren introduced me to Mark Pauling in 1980. We did a suicide club, would do field trips to weird places. And Gary, like I said, was a search, search engine, and he found weird people. And he, would, he wanted to interconnect with them, find out what they're doing. So he ran into Mark, thought he was doing really cool stuff. He took a group of the Suicide Club people as, as an event down to Mark's brand new uh, 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 warehouse space that he'd just gotten in, a funky old warehouse space. We met Mark and walked around and looked at his stuff and talked to him for a while. That was the first time I met him. It was before he blew his hand off. He blew his hand off uh, uh, about six, eight months, a year later, experimenting with uh, rocket fuel. It's a long story. Um, and, uh, and so then I would start running, and it was a different group, we, there wasn't any crossover at that point, but I would start running into Mark and his, his uh, crews in abandoned buildings, because we were exploring abandoned buildings all over the place. So I literally, we'd hear a noise, like, who's that? You know, there's a giant abandoned building. And we'd be like, oh, it's that guy, oh, it's that guy, I know him. So I, I'd literally run into him in these abandoned spaces. And so we started trading information on abandoned buildings. I'd go, hey, Mark, I ran into this great, you know, this great little ship to shore warehouse down here. There's a bunch of uh, MRIs, you know, meals ready to eat in it, and a bunch of other stuff. And you go, oh, that's cool. And he'd go check it out. Or he'd tell me, yeah, we're in this old building, this old, like, government uh, office building, you know, like a record uh, storage house down on Harrison Street. And you can get in by climbing up the telephone pole and climbing the window. You know, so we'd, like, trade information on places. And we did that for years. And then uh, and I would go to SRL shows. Uh, I wasn't a, a member. I wasn't a, a you know I didn't work on the shows. I wasn't a crew member. But through the 80s, I went to several shows and kind of knew a couple people involved. And then in the uh, uh, early 90s, I started working on the shows. I realized I could make props for them. And so these show, the shows, the SRL shows are the big shows are massive shows, sometimes as large as a football field with machines that are big as dinosaurs, literally, and I'm not exaggerating. It's all online. Go to srl.org and you can see all their videos. Mark recorded everything they did as an artist. Uh, they did dozens and dozens of large-scale shows over the years. And he started attracting technologists from Stanford, from UC, serious scientists who would go to SRL to slum it, to make weird stuff and blow things up, right? It was super fun, very fun crew. And so that's how I knew Mark, and there was this crossover. We would bring, in, in Cacophony days, when, when we started Cacophony, we would go, be going into all these places, and I was also a neon sign contractor, and at that time I was a, a, a worker, but I would find, I would bring old neon sign transformers and give them to Mark. They used them for igniters for their machines. They used them because you could get a, a big arc as an igniter and it would light up something. So I'd give them transformers and stuff. We'd just drop off materials there if we'd run into something, or keep, and we kept trading information. That's how I knew SRL and how I came to start working with SRL in the 90s. Um, amazing group. Uh, Mark is unjustly uh, not very well re regarded or remembered now, not nearly as well as he should be, and he's possibly, in, in my uh, estimation, one of the most important artists of the last 50 or 60 years, because you can look at what he did and uh, the hundreds of people who went through survival research labs and the dozens of people who went through and then went on to become important artists, all of whom apprenticed at SRL. And, uh, and there are a bunch of them, technologists and artists, who will all tell you, yeah, I worked at SRL, it was one of the most fun things I ever did. I learned how to, you know, like how to 
how to code like remote control machines that spit flames, you know, or, or whatever. So later, when I when I when I started running uh, Burning Man, when we started doing Burning Man, um, all of the fire art and uh, and machine art performers at Burning Man for the first ten years apprenticed at, Bur at SRL. All of them, you know. Uh, Cal Spellatek was the first machine artist in the desert. He was an SRL alumnus. John Sergardi, Empire Dirt, Greg Lay with the giant Tesla coils. Austin Richards and John Behrens, Dr. Megavolt. They do the the uh, you know the, the the Megavolt thing with the uh, the Tesla coils and, and wearing a wearing a Faraday cage and being electrocuted. Um, Flaming Lotus Girls. I mean, uh, all of these groups. Uh, the steampunk scene. The steampunk. Uh, 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 subculture was entirely influenced originally by people from SRL. I can actually, I was at I think the first like, like steam generated, you know, uh, uh, incident, you know, and it was an SR, at, 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 after an SRL event where Kimrick Smythe started fiddling around with a steam engine and that was, would have been in, you know, 92. So, uh, you know, well before the steampunk thing started, a long time before the steampunk thing started. Okay. So, I guess the main thing about all of this stuff that I've been involved in, and it took me many, many years to realize this, is that we had collectively, and really without a driving central core philosophy, we had created a culture in San Francisco, literally culture between the Suicide Club, later Cacophony, and Survival Research Labs, and there are other groups, we weren't the only groups doing interesting things like this. And the culture evolved around the concept of doing shit for free, of like doing creative work, doing outrageous stuff, doing stuff maybe you weren't supposed to do, but doing it collectively with other people, not for money, not based on money. I mean, SRL shows, Mark would charge money for the shows, but he was very intent on charging you know low amount of money for the. I mean, he charged like ten dollars for a show that people were saying, well, you could charge twenty easy for this. And go, no, I don't. I want people to be able to afford to come and see the show. Yeah, we have expenses. We have, you know, major expenses renting the space to do the show in or paying for, uh, you know, paying fines or whatever, which would happen sometimes. But, but he wanted to keep the stuff, he wanted to be, it'd be available to, avail, to be available to as many people as possible. And he would also allow people to, to be part of his group if they would work and if they were interested in, in building this stuff. Communiver, uh, community through the Suicide Club, through Cacophony, these events were not for money. Nobody was making money on these things. I mean... Uh, you know, they were for people to get together and organize and create things together. So, so Cacophony uh, carried on, and, and we kept doing, uh, uh, you know, really fun events. People, anybody could organize an event. And um, one one woman, Carrie Galbraith, who uh, joined Cacophony about a year after we started up, she joined in 1987, she had a kind of an art background, because Cacophony and, and this earlier Suicide Club weren't art groups. We weren't, unlike Survival Research Labs, we weren't, specifically designed to be art groups, although there were some people in the groups that were, you know, a couple people that might be might be artists, some people who went on to be professional artists. Most people would not have self-identified as being artists. It was more of a, it's even hard to explain, we were pranks, social organizing, we were like a social group. People would get together to do things for the reason of doing things together, not to create a, bo a body of work. So consequently, we didn't record things as though it was art. So there are some recordings or photographs, there's some film and later video, but it was never recorded like SRL very specifically. So Cacophony, we kept doing these weird events. Carrie Galbraith had this concept uh, that she called the zone trip concept, which she based on uh, her interest in uh, Russian filmmakers, the Tarkovsky brothers, and uh, their film Stalker, which is based on a Russian novel by a guy named Boris Strugatsky. Uh, not, uh, Tarkovsky wasn't a brother, Tarkovsky was a filmmaker. And his, his movie was based on a novel by the Strugatsky brothers. And in this novel, there's a place called The Zone, which is this weird, otherworldly place where anything can happen. It's like physics doesn't really work. People disappear or reappear. You never really know what's going to happen there. So Carrie was really, uh, she was really uh, inspired by this concept. So she started doing what she called zone trips, along with Phil Bewley. And the zone trip was basically an away trip, like a vacation or like a, an out-of-town trip that Cacophony would do, where we'd all get together, jump together you know, in a couple of vehicles and drive somewhere to do uh, uh, surreal tourism and to enter this pataphysical zone called the zone. Called the zone. And uh, the first zone trip we did was to Los Angeles. And uh, it was what I'd call like sort of pataphysical tourism. You know, we, we went there and anyone in the group could 
could decide, well, I heard about this thing in L.A., I want to go there. Like, I, I knew about the Hollywood letters and I wanted to climb them, so we went to the Hollywood letters and climbed them, which you could do at that time. Uh, another person heard about this neighborhood that was abandoned where the, right by LAX, the airport, where the planes would fly right over your head. So we went there. We just went to all these places in like a crammed three days, super, super intense. And that was the first zone trip that we did. And to get there, driving down, we stopped at Magic Mountain, got out of our vans in this field, drew a line in the dirt, and ceremonially stepped over the line into the zone. And by crossing over that physical dirt line, we stepped into this, you know, this metaphysical zone, this pataphysical zone. And so that was a really profound, simple, but profound idea. And so we did a few more zone trips. And then uh, the first Burning Man at Black Rock Desert, which was in uh, Labor Day of 1990, was a cacophony zone trip. Um, Kevin Evans and I, Kevin was a you know cacophony organizer and been, it was part of this group of artists that came involved in cacophony. That's when art came into cacophony. It was like 1988, 89. And Carrie Galbraith and her fellow students from the Art Academy, a bunch of them, uh, Vanessa Kummerly, Sebastian Hyde, Greg Nersessian, and Kevin Evans, came and joined uh, cacophony. And, and there was a big influx of, you know, at this point in time, kind of serious artists into the group. So our fri more frivolous more free form, you know, we're not artists, we're just creating weird events, kind of got a little bit more, a little bit more organized or a little bit more serious at that point in time. And so her own trip concept was really profound and Kevin and I had come to realize and sometime in like, I guess, early 1990 that both of us had been out to the Black Rock Desert. He had gone out with uh, P. Siegel and uh, Cindy Kolnick and, and a few other people to a wind sculpture festival in 1989. Uh, that was put on by Planet X out on the desert, which is a, a small art collective. Not part of this is pre Burning Man. They had nothing to do with, with any burn, any Burning Man thing. Burning Man was just basically a uh, you know like a, a bonfire at that time. And so Kevin had been out there on this this group uh, this group outing, and I had been out there a couple times with friends of mine from work um, to go monster trucking and just and camping and driving really fast across the playa at night with the lights out and you know you know basically just tripping out on this amazing environment. So when he and I realized we'd both been there, we were super excited, like, my God, what an amazing place this is. I mean, you could do anything there. It's like this blank slate. And so Kevin, being an artist, you know, said, we should do an event out there. You know, we should do like, a, like an art event out there. And I'm like, sure, let's do one. So we started organizing one uh, early in, uh, uh, in 1990. And then at the same time, Michael Michael and I and a few other people had gotten pretty heavily involved in, start, in helping with the Baker Beach uh, Burning Man event, and at that point, Burning Man was basically it was a bonfire on the beach. You know, I mean, it was. Uh, uh, I think in '88 uh, there were you know maybe a hundred people, '89 maybe a couple hundred people, and then in 1990 we went out at summer solstice because the event was to be done in summer solstice, and uh, it got shut down by the police. It's a long story; it's been told many times. It got shut down by the police, and um, and. Uh, so we ended up having to take the components of the man back, and we were very depleted, and not, you know, we we're very tired, and you know, we ended up storing the thing in a in a parking lot. And anyway, it's a long story, but uh, but so that was the first Burning Man on on, uh, on on the on the desert was this cacophony event that Kevin and I had planned out. And when when uh, the thing got shut down on Baker Beach, Kevin said, "Hey, why don't we invite Jerry James, who's the main organizer, and Larry Harvey." Uh, were the two two main guys kind of putting on this bonfire? Why don't we invite them to come to the desert? And Jerry had been already been in Cacophony. He had he had solicited us earlier. Um, he thought it was a cool group, and he joined in '88. And uh, and he was doing this you know this this uh, event every year, the, the the Burning Man event with uh, with with his buddy Larry. And and uh, so we kind of, at that point the two groups kind of conjoined, you know the group of carpenters led by Jerry, and uh, this group of people in Cacophony um, kind of conjoined. To make the early early Burning Man group, and then when, when it got shut down in Baker Beach, we stored it and then ended up taking it out to this event that Kevin and I had already planned. And there were about 70 people that came up from San Francisco, um, most of whom were Cacophony members, and then a handful of these carpenters that worked with Jerry who didn't know anything about Cacophony, but you know kind of came out and, and 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 came to the event. And then a handful of locals from Gerlach area that came out to the Burning Man that year. And that was the first one on the desert. So when we got to the desert, we drove all night in a, in a caravan, I think about 30 or 30 people or so in the first first caravan out. We drove all night, got to Bruno's, uh, uh, this restaurant in Gerlach around dawn, went in and all ordered breakfast. And uh, 
the locals, yeah, I'd been going out there for a while, for, for a little while at this point in time, and I, I didn't really know anybody out there, but I kind of knew the lay of the land a little bit. And, uh, and so the locals, I found out later when I, get, when I became very close and intimate with the local people, worked with them very closely, and became very good friends with many of them, I found out the stories that go around, because stories and myths grow up, and stories, you know, go from person to person, and of course become ridiculously uh, inaccurate, of course, as you know. And so the story, the story was a bunch of crazy hippies from San Francisco showed up to do some kind of satanic ritual up on the playa. That was the story. Now, so some, of course, some of the locals came up there, because this is Nevada, this is gunsling in Nevada, right? And so the locals, some of the locals came up to kind of check us out. What they found is a bunch of crazy, hippie-looking people who were extremely well-armed, because at that point in time, we were a shooting group. We were like a, the, the, many of the people in Cacophony were gun owners, and we did a lot of shooting events. So we had, we had guns displayed, we were, you know, and so the locals realized, okay, yeah, they're a bunch of Satanist hippies, maybe, but they're armed. So... In a way, that was a big icebreaker. That was like uh, realizing we had something in common. I'm dead serious. I'm not making this up. You can tell, you can ask other people who are there. Locals kind of like, okay, yeah, I mean, they're kind of weird, but they're armed, so okay, they must be okay. You know, or at least they'll shoot back at us if we fuck with them, so we won't fuck with them. And I'm dead serious. So that was that was really the icebreaker. And myself, Michael, Michael, uh, you know, some some of the other early folks involved with the uh, with the event um, were from you know working class backgrounds. And some of us were from rural background, and so we hit it off with people in Gerlach really well. You know, we hit it off with them really well. Bruno let us store shit on his property for four years or more without paying, without charging us any money, because he knew we weren't assholes. We were, you know, we were friendly. We didn't fuck with them. We didn't mess anything up. We did what we said we were going to do, and uh, and he also knew that we were bringing people out there, which was money in his pocket. So the Burning Man event was allowed to continue the first few years because we were. We became, we formed pretty 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 early on. We formed good relationships with the people in town. We rented propane canisters from uh, Forrester's uh, Propane in town, and just got to know the bar. You know, we stayed at the bars, ate in town, bought stuff in town. Got to know Cecil, who was the main guy at the uh, you know ran the ran the uh, uh, Cecil and Skiki who ran the uh, the uh, Texaco station there, and um, you know Bill Stapleton, and it, we just got to know the people in town. And that was how that event was allowed to survive. Later, as it became bigger, it was allowed to survive because the uh, agencies involved realized it was a, started to realize it was going to be a cash cow for them, that they would make a lot of money from it, and so they allowed it to continue. There's a whole other. There's like, you know, we can go on and on and on about that, and, and there you'll find a lot of opinions from different people about how how all that evolved. This is mine. So, <clears throat> last question for this session. Um, how did the rest of the Cacophony Society reacted to Burning Man? Well, the rest of the Cacophony Society reacted to Burning Man like, like it was natural. I mean, it was a, couldn't have been a more natural thing to do. See, that Cacophony was about pushing your boundaries and about doing weird things and trying to trying to work together as a group to to create a life, really, to create experience, to create experience. So. The Black Rock Desert was a perfect place for this. It was a blank slate. All the experience that you could create there was held in bold relief by the complete starkness and emptiness of the environment. It was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. Because anything that you did was like jumped right out. You know, you couldn't avoid it. Um, now with the event with 70,000 people, it's, you know, it's a different thing. It's overwhelming, I'm sure. But, but uh, at that point in time, it was, uh, uh, you know, and, and not com you know I mean, there's no comparison. There are different events. But... It was such a liberating, eye-opening, and truly uh, shocking place to be because of that physical environment. The physical environment, when there were a hundred people there, the environment, it overwhelmed you. I mean, we had a dust storm, you know, second or third year out there, and we watched it. It was like in a fucking crazy movie. We, we could see the cloud. By then, we knew the wind patterns. We knew the area. I'd gotten fairly... Uh, proficient at reading the weather and at understanding the environment out there because I went out there a lot, not just for Burning Man. I went out there a lot with my girlfriend Vanessa, who we were, you know, two of the main organizers of the event. We go out there in the summer many times, and so we got to know the playa very well. There's no one out there. There was no one. You'd go out there for weeks on end and not see anyone, and then there'd be like one wind sailor out there, or a couple wind sailors, or the, for maybe four days, guys would go out there to blow. You know, the rocket people would be out there blowing off rockets. The rest of the year, there's no one. You could go on that playa, and we'd go up on a mountain off playa and look out onto the flat, you know, during the afternoon just to see if there are any camps. We'd go through field glasses to make sure there's nobody around. And on that playa at night, 
you know, and drive across the playa at 90, 100 miles an hour with the lights out, tripping, okay? I'm serious. It was just, it was that free. The freedom of that place, of that environment, was monumental. It was, it was shocking. And that was the most incredible environment to do what we were doing in. It was a blank slate that insisted on creativity. It demanded it. It demanded that you that you stand there and have the wind blow around you, you know? I mean, I don't know how to put it. Uh, uh, and last question, just to pay tribute to the people who, who actually did that. Who were the main artists, if you want to call them artists, who, who uh, built uh, things for the P. first Pete Siegel, Louis Brill, uh, uh, Vince Kowalski, Carl Hauser, um, Cindy Kolnick, Jerry James, who was one of the original Burning Man guys. He was, he was very big. Uh, Chris, uh, Chris Campbell a little bit later. Um, there, there, there are hundreds. Um, but the first year, you know, uh, um, uh, Dan Miller um, out, out of Cacophony, um, Michael Michael, Kevin Evans, Sebastian Hyde, Greg Nersessian, Vanessa Coomerly, you know, um, they're just, uh, you know, uh, Rob Schmidt, um, you know, Joe Fenton, J.D. Bogman, we called them. And this is another thing. See, in the Suicide Club, we had done a thing. This is where the culture comes from. In the Suicide Club, we would do events and games, and we would make up phony, we would make up names for the games that we would do or for the event. We would, we would come up with pseudonyms, and we would use them. And, and, uh, and we never kept them. They didn't become, we didn't become the name, right? But we would use a name for events, and then we'd make up another name for another event. I was Vito Latoni for the detective games that we did. We used to do these live action detective games on the street, dressed up in suits with fake guns, and we'd kidnap people and do all sorts of stupid shit like that. Really fun events, but I, I, I had a phony name for that, Vito Latoni. So, we, so cacophony names was, a, was, a, was a sort of a given thing at that point in time, making up a name for your event was a typical thing that we did. So when Burning Man started, of course it was natural to make up, start make up your Burning Man name, which then became the Playa name. But what happened with that is that this event got bigger and became much more of a, much more of a, 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 a gravitational pull. People would get their Playa names and then some people would, you know, become their Playa name. <laughs> they like literally become, which I think is, is goofy and silly. But you know that's what it would become. They take it. They start to take it dead seriously. This 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 culture that grew up around it became, as cultures will do, uh, stultified and and stratified and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, and hierarchical. Whereas originally it was not that. It was an anarchist. It wasn't chosen to be or designed as an anarch politically anarchist event. But it was a naturally anarchist gathering where there were no rules. People were in. People were encouraged to do whatever they wanted to do. They were encouraged not to be dicks, okay? So if you were, you know, but, but there, were no, there was no law. So, for instance, when the Black Rock Rangers was started, which was originally just a suggestive group to help uh, keep people from letting shit blow away. Basically, the first thing was like, well, we got people are stuffed blowing out of their camp, and we do this incredible cleanup. We were, we were fanatical about cleanup and the leave no trace concept. I, I inculcated that concept into people, and me and some other folks, uh, Michael helped with that, uh, Bogman helped with that, Vanessa for sure helped with that. The, it's like, we're going to pick up everything. That meant a cigarette butt. We're not leaving a cigarette butt on the ground here. We're going to clean up everything. Problem is, you get these big fucking winds coming through there, and they blow everything all over the place. So we started uh, inculcating this concept of like leaving no trace, which came from the suicide club. Don't mess up your environment. Don't, you know, when you leave the environment you're in, you don't want anybody to know you were there. So you clean everything up. So we literally would, you know, berate people. You've got to clean up everything. You've got to clean up the. Don't even leave, you know, like a cigarette butt. You know, <laughs> Larry was throwing his cigarette butts all over the place. We made him pick them up. Serious. I'm serious. You know, <laughs> very funny. But uh, uh, and even then we didn't collect everything because some of it would blow miles and miles away. So um, those concepts, you know, those catchphrases that sort of informed the early event, then became. Uh, dogma and then became uh, sort of hyperbole at some point because of course they leave a trace out there now. I mean, you know, they, they do the best cleanup they're humanly capable of, but if you have 70,000 people, some of that stuff blow, you know, goes over the trash fence, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, another story.